<laughs> has a crazy name. Can you imagine being named Astro Teller? You'd like have to be a futurist. You, you like have no other option, which worked out really well for him. He's the captain of Moonshots at Google X, and we're going to bring him out and have a little chat. So Matthew Panzerino is going to be interviewing Astro Teller. Please give him a warm welcome. Thank you. One of my favorite technologies is the ABS system. I'm going to lower the mic, it's going to drive me crazy, speaking of technologies. When you put your foot on the brake on a car, you're not actually mechanically operating the brakes you're making a request to a robot, right? You're saying, here's about how fast I'd like to stop. The robot then takes that request and processes it on your behalf. It's pretty cool, because that's not how we feel when we're pressing the brake. So the robot understands that this is how fast you'd like to stop, but then the robot is gonna do something much more complicated the robot is going to stop that fast, no faster, but subject to this additional constraint that it might need to pump the brakes. That even when you're pressing harder, it may let up on the pressure on the brakes because it wants to make sure that you don't end up losing rolling friction and going into a skid because then it'll take even longer to stop. That is a wonderful technology moment. And the reason I like it so much is because we don't have to mess with it. We just say at this very high level, here's what we want, and magic happens. The lower level details are just taken care of for us. When technology reaches that level of invisibility in our lives, that's actually its ultimate goal, its highest and best purpose. It vanishes into our lives. It meets us all the way, 100% of the way, over on our side of the fence. Right? It says, you don't have to do the work, I'll do the work. You don't even have to do the work of thinking about the work. I'll do that too. It doesn't require us to operate it. It doesn't ask us to have an interface. It doesn't say, you need to slow down for this. You need to change your style. You need to express your desires via an unnatural interaction. It just takes care of it. Human attention is really the biggest, uh, most precious commodity now. I think I'm batting about 70% attention right now. It's pretty good. We live in this perpetual state of emergency interrupt that really 10, 20 years ago, only 911 operators and air traffic controllers used to have to tolerate. And now we all tolerate it all the time. And even the digerati, the people in this room, understand that even though technology is wonderful, there's something that's not quite right. This whiplashing that we have going back and forth between our devices and our surroundings, it leaves us feeling something short of totally natural, right? You know that experience. I just had Matthew, who's gonna come out here in a minute, tell me he was addicted, and he didn't mean in the good way, to his phone. He described going to Twitter and then forgetting what he was doing and then just going to Twitter again because it was like muscle memory on his part. And someone up on the elevator this morning apologized to me while she was looking down because she wanted to tell someone that I was here and she had to apologize for doing it. That doesn't mean that technology is a bad thing. It just means that we know in our hearts that technology at its best should make us feel at worst no less human than we currently feel. Ideally it should make us feel even more human than we currently feel and it doesn't always do that. Sometimes it actively makes us feel less human. Then there's this thinking in at least part of our society that this is inherently the case. That by being always connected, we're inherently in a situation that prevents us from being present. And I don't think I buy that. I grant you that always connected is here to stay. There's no point in fighting it. That ship has already sailed. 
But that does not mean, there's nowhere is it written, there's no law of physics which says that just because we're connected, that there has to be this schism between our physical lives and our digital lives. That's just a phenomenon created by the technology in its current state. And we can do better than that. We have to do better than that. The, in the bigger picture, technology can be and should be like anti-lock brakes, where we don't have to kind of meet it part way. It meets us all the way on our terms. It makes us feel more human instead of less human. It makes us feel more in the moment, not disconnected or pulled apart where we're not sure if we're here or we're in the ether with just our thumbs existing and otherwise disembodied. You know, phones would not be best if they could be cooler looking or if they could weigh less or if they could have more battery life. Phones would be best if we had all the benefits of phones and didn't have to carry them around. That's what would make phones great if we didn't have to poke at them with our thumbs. So one of the missions of Google X is the sort of generalization of this situation, that we're excited about how technology can be used to get technology out of the way. Let me give you some examples. So in the, the world of diabetes is one of the world's worst user interfaces. Here's what the user interface looks like. Every day, hundreds of millions of people stab themselves, bleed, and then offer like a sacrifice their blood to the glucose monitor they're carrying with them. This is not a good user interface. <laughs> It's such a bad user interface that even though in the medium term it's life or death for these people, hundreds of millions of people don't engage in this user interface. <laughs> we can do better than that, guys. We really can. So Google has announced recently that we're developing a contact lens that looks at the glucose in your tear solution. And I think that this is an example of what I was just talking about. It has two features. First, it doesn't involve this interface on your body. There's no blood drawn. But at least as importantly, it's also not asking you to behave in some additional way. We're building it into something that hundreds of millions of people already wear that doesn't ask anything of them. It meets them all the way on their terms. So that's an example of us aspiring to that. Much as I'm fond of anti-lock brakes, cars are the same problem still, right? It's great, it drives me bonkers that when I'm going down the road and the road curves a little bit to the right, that I have to turn the wheel to say to the car, I want it to go straight relative to the road. Like, my, my thinking shouldn't be like this, it's like, I'm not ready to go somewhere else, just keep going. But that is not an effective way to say that. That's crazy that we still have to, it's, it's very much like before the anti-lock brakes, where you'd have to do this frantically so that you didn't skid. We can do better than that. Right now, each one of us, you guys live in New York, some of you, so maybe you haven't learned to drive, but most of us have to spend a lot of energy learning to drive a car. And, and some learn better than others. Then, after that happens, we have to spend the rest of our lives being hyper-vigilant as we drive and text and eat a burrito and put on our makeup. And the best of us are not hyper-vigilant. None of us can be superhuman in looking around and seeing everything in our best moments, and most of us, most of the time, are not in our best moments. And as a result, 30,000 people a year die in car accidents in the United States, just in the United States, every year. That's not acceptable. So this is part of what motivates the self-driving car project at Google X, is saying that sort of micro-sensing of the world, this micro-controlling of every movement of the car, it makes no sense. Just like the anti-lock brakes, the experience you should have should be much more like I want to go home, I want to go to work, I want to go to the restaurant, and it just takes you there. And if you change your mind in the middle, you say, I've changed my mind, let's go there first. That's the level at which we're actually thinking about our trip, not ee, ee, 
That's crazy. And when we stop, when cars actually can do that, we're going to look back and wonder that we ever had to microcontrol the cars in those ways. So that's another example of Google X aspiring to getting technology out of the way. And then there's Google Glass. So I've heard a lot of people say about Google Glass, why are you working on that at Google X? Like, what's the moonshot? I can see the moonshot for you know, diabetes monitoring. I can see the moonshot for self-driving cars, for the airborne wind turbines that you guys are doing, for Project Loon, the, getting the next five billion people online. But what's going on with glass? And I know that there are a lot of people who worry that in general wearable connected technologies are just going to be the next step down this technology path that's draining our attention and causing this schism that I was talking about before between our physical lives and our digital lives. I share that worry with those people. So does everyone on the Glass team. The moonshot for Google Glass is to harmonize the physical and the digital worlds. It is specifically to find a way to help people be naturally, elegantly situated physically and digitally at the same time. There's no law of physics that can't happen just because we haven't done it yet. And Google Glass is not all the way there, but it's a good thing to aspire to and that's the journey that Google Glass is on. So the most successful wearable technology in human history, we don't even think of as a technology anymore, it's eyeglasses. It was invented over 700 years ago and it was adopted by people because when you put it on your life is just richer and more wonderful. And it's become so pervasive in our society and so accepted in our society because you don't have to operate the technology. It does not come with a user manual. You don't have to fight with its user interface. It doesn't run out of batteries. It just does what it's supposed to do and the only time you really notice it is when it's gone, when you take it off. That's the way a technology should be and that's where Google Glass aspires to. Our aspiration is to make a 10 times improvement on that kind of experience so that you can put on something that levels up your experience of the world, but the only thing you have to do is put it on. The rest of the work should be taken care of by the technology so that your experience of the world is seamless, it makes you feel more human instead of less human, you don't have to operate it or fight with user interfaces. At its best, that's what it should be. So I, I want to challenge you guys to think about this for the technology that you're currently working on. Don't think of the technology you're working on as some long road of development at the end of which you're going to release it into the world, congratulations, the world which was already up to its nose, barely above the waterline in technology is now going to have another layer that you've introduced. Think instead, don't change what you're working on. Just think, how could the thing that I'm working on take away a feature? How could the thing that I'm working on take away a user interface? How could the thing that I'm working on disappear into people's lives? Because that's the true calling of the thing that you're working on. This disconnect between the physical and the digital world, between our devices and our surroundings, is not inherent in the technology. We have just failed so far to get technology to its higher purpose, which is to get out of people's way, to make them feel more human. Wouldn't that be awesome if technology more generally, more widely, more often would meet us all of the way on our terms? We got its benefits and we didn't have to compromise anything in return. All right, I'm going to take some questions, um, probably uh, from Matthew. I appreciate your attention. Thanks.